right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Adam, and I'll be your moderator. We're welcoming Dr. Stephanie Tran back for the sixth and final time this year. I can't believe there's been six already. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A section, and we'll get to them at the end. And Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation, live or on demand. Over to you, Dr. Tran. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for, again for, share, for joining me tonight. I know it's been, I'm sure, a long week as in, and long uh, time for everybody after the busy Thanksgiving weekend. So I definitely appreciate everyone for joining me. Um, my name is Dr. Stephanie Tran, and I'm an endodontist. I really want to thank Henry Schein Dental Academy for having me again. I'm all, I always enjoy being on the webinars with Henry Schein and providing education for everyone involved. So thank you, especially to Henry Schein for having me. Um, today, it's going to be kind of a continuation of a, and kind of putting together a lot of the information that I've um, discussed in previous webinars. So definitely check out my series on the Henry Schein Dental Academy for previous webinars about radiographs and CPCT because today I'm going to be discussing the um, complex root anatomy in endodontics, evidence-based approaches to treatment planning. So today we're going to be discussing the basics of how to evaluate 2D radiography, 3D radiography, evaluating the periapoporeal uh, lesions themselves for the complex anatomy, evaluating the 2D radiography and how to kind of measure things, um, how to anticipate things, and what are some of those key indicators for additional canals and complex curvature. And when you are using 3D radiography, how to actually manipulate the CBCT and how to read it. Um, so for a little bit about me, my name is Dr. Stephanie Tran and I'm an endodontist. That means that I'm a dentist who specializes in treating diseases of the pulp. That's the tissue inside the tooth. Most importantly, I treat dental pain and help my patients save their teeth. I've always been a huge science and art nerd. I spent most of my childhood going to museums and reading lots of science books. So dentistry was the perfect match. It's the marriage of science and art. So I've wanted to become a dentist since I was seven years old and it's definitely my passion. Endonautics involves the science of understanding the inside of the tooth, of understanding microbiology and figuring out the mystery of the diagnosis. It also involves an art to it the artistry of delicately treating the inside while being minimally invasive. Those are all reasons why I love endodontics and what I do. Unfortunately, root canals get a bad reputation for being uncomfortable, but it doesn't have to be like that. When patients come to see me, I try to make it as great of an experience as possible, comfortable and relaxing and even kind of fun. So hopefully not only will the patients enjoy having the root canals, but most importantly, it's going to be more fun for all of you out there when you're evaluating and doing the endodontic treatment. So for my background, I'm originally from California and I moved to snowy, cold New York City um, after a, quite a, a interesting educational career moving around to different areas. So I grew up in California, did all of my educational training there, including the accelerated uh, dental bachelor's in dental program at University of Pacific. And um, I then completed a GPR at Stony Brook and practiced as a general dentist. So that background in aesthetics and restorative dentistry in dental school, as well as my GPR and GP private practice has definitely shaped my background and my um, point of view as an endodontist. But after practicing as a general dentist, I knew my passion was definitely in endodontics. So I went back to residency and completed my um, endodontics training at University of Tennessee, where I was chief president. And I returned to New York because I definitely really love the area. And I'm now in private practice where I have a concierge private practice. And I work with quite a few um, aesthetic and restorative practices to help take care of our patients together as a whole. So I serve both New York City and the Hamptons. So when it comes to radiography, first we want to understand that diagnosis. 
And this has to be in conjunction with clinical findings. I say this because we always start off with a clinical evaluation, of course, we're evaluating our patients. During that clinical evaluation, we're gonna be taking those radiographs and putting everything together. We know that first things first, evaluating the teeth visually is going to be extremely important. We use magnification such as a microscope and loops, and we can use other means of um, identification as well, such as uh, photography, transillumination, and dyeing the teeth. The photography um, can either be as advanced as really beautiful DSLR cameras, which will give gorgeous macro photography, but a lot of intraoral cameras nowadays are have excellent um, HD resolution. The importance of th these photographs is that in addition to visually seeing it with our loops or microscopes, the HD cameras can take a look at the teeth even closer at even higher magnification as well as providing patient education, which is going to be very important when discussing these aspects or, for example, the possible difficulty of these teeth with our patients. Other aspects of the diagnosis are going to be the patient's um, symptoms, reported symptoms. Things like if whether or not they have chewing or biting tenderness, the swell, any swelling, any bumps or pimples on the gingiva, and any particular types of pain or sensitivity. All these things will give clues when making our diagnosis and help us figure out the diagnosis in conjunction with the radiography. Um, additional aspects to look for clinically will be what is going on with the tooth clinically. So that will be the caries, the restoration, the periodontal findings such as the probing depth and the um, and the gingiva uh, characteristics, if there's pockets or probings, frication involvement, as well as tooth mobility. In some cases, that in conjunction with the radiographs will make it very, very easy for a diagnosis, such as this case presented. Other clinical findings are going to be whether or not the teeth have visual fractures, if there's a sinus tract or swelling, and the location of the caries as well. And then when we're looking at those fractures, we want to see, and, and the caries, we want to definitely, of course, evaluate if the teeth are restorable, how that looks in conjunction with the radiographs, and what the fractures and um, the other aspects of the tooth look like, whether they are stained, how, um, whether the restorations have certain issues, that kind of thing. All these will come, in, uh, come to play important roles when evaluating the radiographs. When it comes to evaluating the radiographs, we first want to take a look with two-dimensional radiography. We know already know from two-dimensional radiography that the anatomy can become quite complex. And we know from our previous research um, historically that the teeth anatomy complexities are extremely involved. Bertucci in 1974 um, uh, classified premolar anatomy, and one in 1969 before that also classified it. The importance of this is that the premolars have some of the most complex anatomy, and much of the time the um, molars can be defined, or at least the roots of uh, certain aspects of the molars can be classified according to these classifications as well. So a lot of times the most uh, complex areas of certain of the molars will be um, classified, the anatomy of those canals will be classified according to these original classifications. So in the case of molars, it will be the mesial buccal root. That can be treated almost like a premolar because it will have one, two, sometimes even three canals. And then the mesial root of lower molars are also have the same situation. So those classifications are used to then determine the complexity and what to expect for the canal anatomy and thus the canal difficulty. And so we know from all the previous research that canals for different teeth can be quite complex. Each type of tooth has a certain number of canals that can be expected, as well as a certain number of canals that may not be expected, but can be an, a certain uh, percentage of, of uh, incidents. So for example, um, uh, 
mandibular second molars normally have like, three canals, but um, it will, it can have sometimes four canals in certain situations or one canal in certain situations. And it's important what to look for. It's important to understand what to look for on the radiograph to help us then expect what those percentages will be. So it's, a lot of times it's like gambling. You want to place your bets on what are the most likely situations and take a look at the radiographs to see what those likely situations will be. And sometimes there are rare situations, of course, but we need to know what to look for to expect them. So on the periapical and bite wing radiographs, there are going to be certain things we're going to be looking for. Of course, we're going to be looking for the bone loss. We're going to be looking for cation involvement, feral, periapical radiolucencies. And then when it comes to the canals, we're going to be looking at the shape of the canals, the density of the um, pulp chamber, how large or tall it is, as well as um, the curves of the canals themselves. The existing location of the curves will determine how complex the canal curvature and compl how complex the canal management will be. So for example, if there is a severe curvature in the coronal or a severe curvature in the apical, that's going to increase the overall difficulty of, um, of the case. Additionally, the height of the pulp chamber is going to be particularly, um, uh, particularly evident in a bite wing although it can be measured on a periapical as well. The reason why this is important is because if, it, if a pulp chamber is particularly large and tall and really dark, so for example, on the left case, the mesial section of the pulp chamber is very dark, but the distal section is, very, is much smaller, it's shorter, it's called a receded pulp chamber. That means that there's been a calcification. That makes sense because that should be in line with the existing restorations. So for example, or existing um, issues that would cause inflammation or pulpal irritation. So for example, one thing I'd be looking for on the left uh, preoperative radiograph is that the, um, since the pulp chamber is smaller on the distal, so it's shorter and it's larger on the mesial, it's going to, I'm going to then expect that it's easier for me to find the canals on the mesial. Secondly, I'm going to try to see why that distal section of the pulp chamber is shorter. So in this case, this makes sense. There's a larger section of the restoration on the distal, meaning there, it, it's deeper. The deeper caries and restoration is, like the closer it is to the pulp, the more irritated, inflamed the pulp is going to be, the more likely the pulp is going to have tertiary dentin uh, formation and then have recession. So then, I'm putting the, the clinical findings of the restoration and the caries together with the radiographic findings. And that's going to help me plan that, okay, there's, it may be a little bit more difficult to find the distal buccal canal. Additionally, I can see that the canal um, exits the pulp chamber at a certain angle and then has a severe curvature back towards the distal. That's then going to make me expect that that severe curvature, and I'm going to look for the point of where the curvature is most severe. So it's going to be at that mid root level. Then I need to, then I know I need to manage that mid root curvature carefully because that's going to be the most common area for instrument separation um, as well as other endodontic mishaps. Um, to move on to the case on the right side, again, when we're looking at the bone, the pulp, we're putting all this together with the clinical findings. So in this case, I could see that there was severe curvatures in the apical portion of the um, of both the mesial and the distal canals. So I know that I need to do careful management of the canal system because that is going to be important to avoid endodontic mishaps. Additionally, I can see that the pulp chamber is receded. So it's much thinner. It's a thin black line or a thin dark line, that pulp chamber. So I'm going to expect certain amounts of, um, of calcification and that I need to be extra careful when placing the access because basically if a pulp chamber is receded, there's, it's more calcified, it's thinner. When you're accessing, you're not going to have that obvious drop that you feel sometimes or that you're looking for sometimes and that was originally taught in 
dental school. So the I need you would need to be extra careful when accessing to avoid possible perforation. Basically, if you access so quickly and you go past the pulp chamber uh, roof and go right into the floor, you're going to be at a high risk of perforation. Another thing I'm looking for for those radial opacities are within the canal itself. So for example, the distal canal um, on that case on the right side. So the distal canal of that lower molar is radiolucent in the pulp chamber portion, but radio slightly radio-opaque in that mid-root portion. That tells me that there's a calcification within the pulp pulp chamber, I mean, sorry, canal system. That calcification can be one of two things. It could be the possible like some uh, dentin in the isthmus. It could be the pulp has some fibrosis itself and I would be expecting calcification of the pulp itself as well. And um, so things like that would make me expect that uh, there, that there is calcification within the, the distal canal and to be extra careful about it. And when it comes to these um, these measurements, you're going to be looking at those uh, at those radio passes and radio lucencies within the canal system for both the pulp horns, looking at the location of the orifices, looking at the location of the frication and the center of that curvature. And all this can be measured fairly accurately with both digital radiography, as well as especially accurately with 3D technology. The 3D imaging allows for very, very accurate measurements. So for example, you could measure the um, occlusal table to the pulp chamber, pulp chamber roof, as well as the pulp chamber floor. You can measure approximately where the orifices should be located or where they are in a relation to everything else. And when it comes to the uh, radiolucencies of the bone, you're also looking for the shape of the lesions and where that is in relation to the canals and the apex itself. So one of the big, big hints is like, if a periapical radiolucency, as I discussed, you're looking for its location and its relation to the apex, you're looking to see if it's off center. If it's off center, pro tip, you may suspect a lateral canal. You, there are other concerns as well, so such as endoperio lesions or fractures. That's why you keep we keep hearing, oh, J-shaped lesions, J-shaped lesions. What does that mean? So the biggest takeaway after all this is that J-shaped lesions do not always mean that there is a vertical root fracture. But what we're looking for is the shape of the lesion as well as where it is in, lo in relation to everything else of the tooth. So for example, my case on the left side, those anteriors, we can see that tooth number eight. So that is the um, central, upper right uh, central. Um, we can see that that periapical radiolucency is off center. It's slightly curved um, towards the mesial. So something like that, it would be really unusual for the apex to have a vertical root fracture at that point and especially a tooth that's untreated so that's why I wouldn't be expecting that so when I you can see compared to the post-operative radiograph that there is a lateral canal and it's right where that periapical radiolucency is so we can see that periapical radiolucencies are often related to the location of other canals, not just the apical foramen. So we need to be expecting if a periapical radiolucency is off center that there may be a lateral canal. Another possibility is whether the apex may have a uh, curvature at the end that will also possibly make it look like that the, that the periapical radiolucency is quote unquote off center. But this also, um, I need, I would like to, like put a, a, a note on that, which is that that doesn't necessarily mean that the periapical radiolucency is off center. It may be off center to the clinical apex, but it may be centralized to the actual um, anatomical exit. So that's why it's important to understand the differentiation. When you're looking at a periapical radiolucency being off center, it has to be considered, is it off center um, to the anatomical apex or off center to the actual canal apex? Because those can mean different things and can cause different things. 
for the case at the bottom, which is next to the implant, so it's that lower, um, the lower anterior tooth, this tooth had a very interesting diagnosis. Uh, I'm not going to get into too, too much detail, uh, but we can see that this tooth had a periapical radiolucency. There was a deep probing. There were definitely some concerns with both the implant and this tooth. I was working in collaboration with both the patient's restorative dentist as well as the periodontist. The periodontist determined that they would definitely recommend trying to maintain this tooth, that it was not uh, recommended to be extracted at this time. So that's, and I had determined that this tooth did have endodontic involvement and pulpal necrosis. And very interestingly, the lateral canal in this tooth at the, um, after the obturation is in line with the off-centered bone loss. It's definitely not a vertical root fracture based on the findings because there wasn't any signs of a fracture either. And this tooth um, definitely had endodontic origins of, of, um, for this periapical radiolucency. So there is the possibility that this bone may grow back between the tooth and the implant. It's definitely something to watch. Um, additionally, we're going to be looking at those canal curvatures and what to expect, um, as well as based on that previ those previous findings I discussed earlier about the likelihood of how many canals and what the shape is, we're going to be evaluating the tooth, what the shape of the root is, and based on that shape of the root, how many the can canals there should be. So for example, we discussed that lower second molars in that previous slide have a certain number of canals and what the percentages are. So whether it's a C-shaped canal, um, whether it's one canal or two canals, that kind of thing. So C-shaped canal systems are very interesting. It's due to fusion of the roots and then the canal um, anatomy often fuses into these uh, C-shaped systems that can join, then separate, then join even within the same tooth. I could see in this particular case that this tooth had been treated, but it was symptomatic, so that was that's why it was recommended for retreatment. When I was planning this retreatment, I saw that it had fused roots, so I was automatically assuming a C-shaped canal system, and I could see that there was a missed canal. And I'm evaluating this existing radiograph for a missed canal because the existing root canal treatment is off-centered. So one of the things that we're looking for when evaluating existing root canal treatment is that it should be very centered within the tooth, within the root. And if it's off-centered, that's when we're suspecting missed canals. I, we can also see like that little triangle portion of the preoperative radiograph that tells me that there was some sealer in that section and I can see a faint line for that missed canal. The importance of that missed canal is that there's going to be debris and bacteria within that canal system that is going to uh, uh, cause these uh, symptoms and the, per the apical periodontitis and um, symptoms to the patient. So since I could tell from this fused root that there is going to be a, some, a most likely a C-shaped canal system, and because it's off-centered, there's missed anatomy, after removing the post and removing the existing root filling material, I looked for an additional canal. Sure enough, found that. I could expect that this additional canal is in the coronal um, third of the canal system based on the way the preoperative radiograph looks, and then I could treat that canal and, um, for the retreatment. When we're evaluating the canal curvature and, um, and that the calcifications, as we had discussed earlier, when we look at the pulp chamber, we're also looking for those radio opacities that I discussed earlier. So for example, in this particular case, uh, the preoperative radiograph on the left, the pulp chamber is very, very narrow. Again, we can see that it almost looks like blobs within the pulp chamber. Those blobs are kind of, um, those kind of blobs are basically pulp stones. And when I can see those uh, areas of opacity, lucency, opacity, lucency all within the chamber, that's how I know that I can expect dystrophic calcification or in other words, pulp stones and calcification within the chamber. And that's when I would expect to be extra careful. Um, additionally, with upper molars, upper first molars are expected to have at least 95% chance of having an MB2, and so that's why I would 
be expecting that MB2 in the mesiobuccal root. Um, so that's what I was looking for when I treated it. And then when I'm looking at um, both the curvature and the calcification, I want to be looking at where that curvature is going to be. So for example, in the premolar in this case, I could see a very faint line um, in the apical area that curves severely distally. So I could expect that there was a severe distal exit. The reason why that's important to look for is because anytime we're instrumenting and there's a severe apical curvature, it's going to be a very, very um, high likelihood of an area for instrument separation or perforation and or transportation and basically exiting out of a different area of the tooth. Additionally, for the upper first molar, I could see from this that not only was it severely calcified, but that severe curvature was in the coronal third of this canal system in that mesial buccal root rather than the apical portion. And both the mesial buccal and the distal buccal roots have S curves. Those are types of things that we're going to be looking for that have that cause very, very high levels of difficulty. Basically, if there's a severe curvature early on, that basically puts a lot of pressure on the file coronally. The coronal portion of the file is often the fattest part of the file. So if you're putting the most pressure on that fattest part, it's going to have a higher risk of separating. Additionally, if there are S curvatures, such as seen in this case, S curvatures mean that at each portion of a curve, that's putting pressure on a file. So if you have multiple areas of curvature within the same canal, that's going to be putting multiple points of pressure on the file, thus putting multiple chances for a file to have separation issues because it's now being having pressure at multiple points. And those pressures are going in opposite directions to have that S curve shape. So that type of pressure um, and it causes a lot of stress on the file and the more stress a file has, the higher risk of separation or other endodontic mishaps as well. So that's why it's very important to keep all these things in mind, both the curvatures and the location of the curvatures and how calcified a case is when evaluating the anatomy and the case difficulty. So when also evaluating the anatomy, like I said, it's a lot of it's kind of gambling. Your plate, you are putting your expectation of how it, how likely is that tooth going to have a certain number of canals and where those canals are located. So Razumova et al. in 2019 is a really interesting paper. It's uh, you can find it online, and that paper discusses lots and lots of incidences, how often we can expect canals to be found, um, the and really unusual canal uh, anatomy configurations. So like uh, lower molars with extra canals, upper molars with certain number of canals, that kind of thing. So that's a good paper to take a look at if you're interested. Um, but basically the point of these kinds of studies is that um, first these studies were done in Different years did it in different ways. Some did it with cleared teeth, some did it with extracted teeth and like serial, um, uh, like cutting them serially. So basically shaving them down and seeing how many canals there were in the tooth. And then now we have very, very non-invasive, high definition ways, high resolution ways through micro CP. Um, so you can see that with, with each study in different years, that's going to have different results. Additionally, the different studies are going to have slightly different incidences for different populations. That doesn't necessarily mean we're going to be like identifying if our patient is a certain race or certain ethnicity that they may have a, and know exactly the number of canals that they have. It's just as that we understand as humans, there are going to be slightly different incidences in different populations. So there are certain things you may want to expect. So for example, upper premolars with three canals rather than just two maybe have a higher incidence in certain populations um, or certain number of teeth will have certain number of canals in certain uh, populations. So those types of studies can help us know what to expect. However, it's going to be extremely important what to look for in addition to what to expect. So for example, in this particular case, um, this isn't actually a third molar which was, it's already very unusual for me to have third molars, but this case was a third molar and this patient really, really wanted to maintain it. It was their terminal um, 
tooth of, on the upper left there and the last tooth in that area to be occluding, they had all their other third molars, so they wanted to maintain it. So for this particular tooth, um, it and as a third molar, third molars are kind of the teeth that don't really follow that many of the rules. As you can see from the numbers here, there's lots and lots of different variations for the number of canals. But so like I said, it's going to be important to be understanding exactly um, where to look for the canals, not just how many canals there may be. In this particular case, this tooth did not appear to have fused roots, so I did not expect a fewer number of canals. And because I could see that there was a mesial buckle and a distal buckle and it appears to have a palatal root, I was expecting three or four canals. This particular tooth had four canals, which is very exciting for me. Um, and uh, being able to treat that with these severe curvatures was very, very interesting. So these types of situations, like I said, it's all about understanding both the likelihood of the number of canals as well as understanding how to look for them as well. So with these, with understanding how to look for the canals, we're also looking for these situations when we're evaluating for retreatment, for example. So with um, retreatments of upper molars, of course, we understand that one of the most common reasons for um, reinfection or apical periodontitis um, of upper molars is going to be missed anatomy. And so with the most common canal to be missed is generally going to be the MB2 in an upper molar. So we can see in these cases, that's something I was expecting and looking for. Um, we know that with upper first molars, the likelihood of having MB2 is going to be at least 95%, or you often 95% depending on the paper, such as Stropko or Ove Peters' papers. But in general, it's going to be very, very, very high likelihood that there's an MB2. About, and then approximately 75% of upper second molars are going to have an MB2. So knowing that these numbers in general, we're expecting that upper molars are going to have an MB2. We also want to know, remember where to find those uh, second mesiobuccal canals. So generally they're going to be straight lingual to the mesiobuccal one canal. And then that way, when we're doing retreatments or initial treatments, we know that we can be addressing all of the important anatomy to then debride and treat the entire anatomical system within the tooth. Um, of course, there's, it's going to be pretty rare to have the really, really unusual numbers of canals, but as Razumova et al. in 2019 described that there is going to be this occurrence sometimes. So this was an exciting one for me where I had a lower molar with seven canals, super, super rare, but it does happen. And for those C-shaped canal systems, this is going to be one that's particularly interesting. Um, we can see from this picture here that the C is very obvious. Now, what does that mean radiographically? So for this particular tooth, um, this tooth had a fracture. We can see that on the distal, or a crack, I mean. That crack extended to the pulp chamber, which caused the irreversible pulpitis, and that's why this tooth was treated. This lower, uh, lower right second molar, we could see that most likely it had a fused root. The reason why I suspected that in this case was because you can see the two sides, the mesial and the distal portions of the canal fairly clearly. However, the middle section of it, so kind of where the furcation area is, doesn't have a very clear um, separation the way the first molar is. It looks kind of fuzzy, kind of radio opaque within uh, the middle and also slightly radiolucent. And then you can see that the canals, the mesial portion of the root and the distal portion of the root convert, start to converge. This is not a super, super obvious um, fusion the way like a single canal lower molar would look, but it, there are going to be signs that there's possible fusion. Um, so that's something I looked for when I access. And then because of that, I, it did confirm clinically that there was a C-shaped canal system. When it comes to C-shaped canal system, because it's a C, we're expecting lots of connections and anastomoses and isthmuses that connect and join all these canals. So it's very important to delicately manage these types of um, canal systems and be able to fully clean them and fully obturate 
them because they are particularly difficult to do both. So knowing when to expect them makes us better able to manage them as well. For that incidence, we can see here that they uh, that they can have very unusual pr um, presentations. So it can be that classifications for C-shaped canals are by Melton in 1991. They can be complete. They can look kind of like a semicolon. They can be completely separate or they can be a single canal. But those classifications are um, can, where, uh, can occur where they join and separate. There's going to be different, a lot of different variations. Even within those classifications, the variations can be seen within the same tooth. So as I said, management of these particular systems are particularly difficult. And this continuation uh, is, can be seen at all different aspects of the tooth. So these are going to be important to keep in mind when we're trying to treat C-shaped systems. So that way we have to keep in mind that it's particularly difficult to clean out everything. C-shaped canals mean that since there's going to be that thinning in certain areas, you have to be extra careful not to perforate, extra careful not to cause transportations or strip perforations. And those little tiny fins and connections, the isthmuses or anastomoses between different portions of the canals mean that Files can easily catch on, catch into those little fins and little like uh, grooves and actually separate as well. So they're going to be very, very difficult to, to manage. Um, and then the these, these findings can be seen also with the micro CTs. And these kinds of findings are important to keep in mind so that with the fused roots, there's going to be certain grooves that's going to make those canals very, very thin in certain areas. We can see with even these modern papers, such as like FAN in 2004, that um, these are going to be very complex to manage. Uh, the prevalence of C-shaped canals being a very unusual tooth is kind of varies. It's supposedly very low in the traditional papers, such as Cook and Cox in 1979. But we have seen that in other subpopulations, it can be a very high prevalence, as high as 30 to 40%. So why is all this important? Because we need to keep in mind that this can affect um, how we treat the teeth. So for lower molars, like we saw, they can have a lot of different canals. One of the things I'm looking for is whether that there's a middle mesial canal and lower first molars especially. Those middle mesials can um, as Pomerantz and et al. saw in 19, wrote in 1981, they can present in lots of different ways. Again, we know that the canal anatomy is very com complex and it's not just a pure little like tube all the way down from start to finish. They can exist as fins, they can be confluent, they can be a separate canal, it can be also just exist as an isthmus as well. Um, for middle mesial canals, the incidences do kind of vary. There's something like 12%. There are other papers such as by Nasrat et al. in 2015. We've seen that they had larger percentages such as 20% or and higher percentages in age. So we know that with patients who are younger, there, it's going to be a higher likelihood of multiple areas of anatomy. So basically the pulp is fatter in a younger patient. Since the pulp is going to be wider and there's less calcification, it's going to be more obvious to have more canals or more parts of the canal that are treatable, such as a higher incidence of middle mesials in younger patients as well. So, um, and then other, when it comes to the biggest takeaway, when it comes to reading the periaporeidiolucencies, I always like to say in my presentations that J-shaped lesions are not pathognomonic for a vertical root fracture or split tooth, as I discussed earlier. Now, why is all this important? Like I said, the effects of canal curvatures have a severe detriment on instrument instrumentation. It's something that we definitely need to consider because the more pressure there is on the instrument, the more stress there is, the higher the likelihood there are going to be problems. We know from the AE paper, so there's an AE um, on the AE website that there is a assessment case, a case assessment form. So you could, it's a very handy thing, especially for um, GPs to take a look at because it's going to be a good way to assess how difficult 
a case is. Um, understanding the difficulty is going to be important to know how to approach a case as well as knowing when to refer. We want to be concerned about all these difficulties in curvature and stuff because we've seen that one of the important one of the important findings in a case is how severe the curvature is, if there's very visible um, canals, if there's calcifications, I as I discussed earlier, because all those things make it a more difficult case. And the more difficult the case is, the more the most uh, frequent endonautic mishaps are going to be in the most difficult cases. So Hogg et al. in uh, 2018 did confirm that as well. So the types of mishaps are going to be all the things that we expect as a mishap. Um, issues with working length, the loss of working length, which is usually caused by ledging of the canal system or um, plugging it up with debris. Um, problems with obturations, such as uh, obturations that are too short or too long. Transportation of the canal is a severe issue, as well as perforations or strip perforations that can cause um, issues as well. So the higher the case difficulty, the more likely it is to have these types of issues. So um, on this tooth, we can kind of see these types of difficulties can really affect the instrumentation. So this is one of my cases. This tooth is a cleared tooth, chemically cleared, so we can actually visually see what's going on. Shout out to the Great Game of Thrones fans out there. So we can see that calcifications can block the canal and it can cause the files to be, um, to actually go in different directions or get caught in different areas. We can see that, there, for example, this tooth has a curvature in the apical portion. It's causing stress on the canals as well, or stress on the files as well. And these and calcifications within the system can ca definitely cause difficulties when instrumenting. For a slightly closer up of how, what's happening within the canal during instrumentation, we can see, for example, lower molars have curvatures throughout the canal, including mid root, and these curvatures can occur both buccal lingually and mesial distally. And we can see that every time there's a curvature, the canal, um, the file is going to have strain. So again, when we see again, the file is straining and slowing down at the curvature. So in that apical portion, for example. So these curvatures, we have to keep in mind that, um, that the different classifications of canal systems will have certain curvatures. So for example, um, the wine type two curvatures will have the highest uh, rate of uh, highest highest degree of curvature, and then uh, type three has slightly less, uh, and then the mesial buckle often has a very high um, degree of curvature, and this is seen by Cunningham and Senia in 1992's studies of canal curvature. So when it comes to CBCT, this gives us even even better closer up view of the anatomy. But we have to know how to take the CBCT. So first, when it comes to CBCT for endodontics, especially when trying to evaluate curvature, it has to be the lowest field of view possible because we want the highest quality of information. So the smaller the field of view, the higher the resolution. So you want to have an HD view of the canals and be able to find the canals and be able to see all the curvature. It's going to be super necessary to have an extremely, uh, the smallest field of view. That's going to have the least issues of anatomy being in the way, of the beam being like dissipated, that kind of thing, or absorbed by different anatomical structures. So that's why a small field of view is going to have the highest resolution. It's also going to have the smallest like pixel size, voxel sizes, and it's going to have the thinnest slices to give that higher resolution. So just to give examples of how we read these CBCTs, we can see that when I'm scrolling through the CBT, CBCT, what I'm looking for is where the canal is within the, um, within the root system. I wanna make sure if, there is an existing root filling material that it's centered. So that's I'm evaluating the existing root filling. For lower, pre, uh, for lower anteriors, as we see, they can have a very oval-shaped system. And that oval-shaped system 
may become more circular towards the apical portion as we saw. So we want to be evaluating to make sure existing root filling material is going to be centered and filling that oval shaped system fully or if there's missed anatomy. Additionally, when we're evaluating, for example, a preoperative rate um, CVCT, we want to see whether or not there's two canals in lower anteriors, which can have a, as high an incidence as 30%. You can see, again, that um, previous res Resumova paper about the different percentages and incidences of, of those types of teeth. And then when we look at it from these proximal views of pro proximal slices, you're again looking at how much an existing root filling, if I'm evaluating it for retreatment, I want to make sure it's fully treating the canal system and if it's centered. Always you're trying to scroll through the accesses, through all accesses for looking at um, the root anatomy. And then when we're looking at that anatomy, if we're looking for a missed canal, so in this particular case, <clears throat> it was my case that I was treating that was very, very calcified. I had found one canal, but I wanted to make sure whether or not this upper premolar had one or two. We know that upper second premolars will have a higher incidence of having only one canal, but it's very hard to make sure sometimes if the tooth is so calcified and it's, it's not clear on a 2D radiograph if it is centered um, because it's so calcified. So for example, in this particular case, I took a CBCT mid-treatment so that I could double check if the root filling material is centered. So we can see through these slices, you can set your CVCT to take serial slices. So you set a certain distance, you tell them how many slices you want it to take and it sets those slices for you. I could see that my root filling material appears to be centered. And from the proximal slices, again, it appears to be centered and the root filling goes all the way to the center of the apex and it's not off centered. So if I'm using a CBCT now that I know how to take it, how do I read it? So again, it's very similar to a 2D radiograph in terms of things to look for. Bone loss, extent of the bone loss, areas of radiolucency or radio opacity, where the periaqua radiolucency is in relation to the um, canal. With CBCTs, we know it's much, much more accurate in diagnosing where the periapical radiolucencies are and how large they are. And we're looking at the root filling material, as I explained earlier, to see where it is inside of the tooth. We're also seeing, trying to see if there's fractures, which are not always that easy to see on a CBCT, but we're also looking for the bone loss in relation to the possibility of a fracture and um, the presence and the proximity of vital structures. So for example, in this particular case, I have to define a fracture, but it's not always this easy. So one of the things to keep in mind, I get the question a lot of whether or not fractures can be seen on CBCTs, Kayat and Michanu, um, more at all. Many papers have said that it's particularly difficult to see a fracture on a CBCT. It needs to be a certain size. So basically the crack has to be like split open enough to be visible. And additionally, it can be very difficult to see a fracture because the existing root filling materials can cause beam hardening artifacts, which will, can often cover the presence of a fracture. So it often are not easily seen on CBCT, but sometimes they can be. So again, when we're looking for those periapical radiolucencies, those, if we're looking for a, a lesion, they are not always pathognomonic for a vertical root fracture, and those vertical root fractures themselves are not always obvious. However, if there is bone loss in um, related to a possibility of fracture, we're looking for the shape of the bone loss that would tell us if there is a fracture. So when we're using the CBCT and we're evaluating it, we can use it to evaluate curvature, for example. This CBCT was taken by my colleague, Dr. Judy McIntyre. We can see through her CBCT, she's scrolling through the CT. She's seeing that there is likelihood of a severe curvature in that mesial buckle and whoop, lo and behold, that curvature is extremely severe. It's a pretty acute curvature in the coronal portion of the mesial buckle and the distal buckle has a severe S curve with a severe apical curvature. So severe meaning it's an acute. So basically if a curve is like a gentle curve, that's going to be a much easier type of curve to treat compared to a curve that's very acute. 
it make a sharp turn. So those sharper turns are going to be those dangerous areas that can cause possible endodontic mishaps, such as ledges, instrument separations, or perforation. And we can see the way she scrolled through it. So a couple of things, you can see the different like arrows. You want to center your those um, accesses on the root and actually each root, you want to put that perpendicular with, um, so uh, one axis is going to be perpendicular, one axis is in line with the root, and you're going to slowly scroll through it to look at all slices and all aspects of the tooth in each section. And then you're going to then reorient and make that perpendicular and parallel axis, um, sorry, axes for each root. So make sure you're focusing it on each root. And the reason for this is because we need to evaluate the tooth for anatomy like earlier, but also for the existing root treatment. So in this case, this patient presented to me for an evaluation for a possible retreatment. Um, we wanna take a look at the existing retreatment and how involved it is, as well as how much tooth structure loss there is and how, um, how severe the curvature is and whether or not this is treatable. So for example, in this particular case, I knew that this was particularly wide in the um, coronal third of the mesial buckle. That tells me one of two things. Either they did treat the MB2 and it just joins as one, or that they excessively instrumented the coronal portion of the canal system, and I have to be concerned that there's not enough tooth structure left. We can see on the CBCT, which is the left image, that that second issue, which was the more unfortunate issue, is the case. So we can see in the upper left picture that it's a big fat white dot, which tells me it's a large root filling. That root filling is so large, it's right up against the side of the root, which means that unfortunately it's in, um, there's very, very little root structure left on the distal portion of the mesial buccal root. And this root filling is severely off-centered within the root in this like cross-section slice. So this tells me that there is a missed MB2. So that not only is it untreated, but it's also extremely over-treated in the coronal portion. Unfortunately, when there's excessive overtreatment in the coronal portion, there is a very highly, a high likelihood of an existing strip perforation or just there's not enough tooth structure to treat. When there's not enough tooth structure to treat, if I were to try to retreat that, it would have a root um, perforation or fracture at that level and it would have a very poor, it in general results in a poor prognosis, which is why um, this CBCT is helpful to evaluate the existing root filling material to then confirm that this tooth should not be treated for a retreatment. When we're then evaluating the anatomy, um, we're again looking for the presence of um, where the root filling material is in relation to the rest of the tooth structure, as well as um, uh, if it fills the anatomy fully, as I described earlier, and if it's centered. So, um, we could see in this case how the anteriors have those oval shaped canal systems that the root filling material in my particular case did fill the tooth fully and was centered. And we can see as we scroll through it, we're evaluating whether it's centered all the way, how it changes, as well as if there are any missed canals, which in this case there was not a missed canal. And then when we're evaluating the resorption, we're also looking for the shape of that in relation to the shape of the tooth, how and then how involved and how much tooth structure loss there is so that we can evaluate that anatomy and seeing if that resorption can be treated or not. So we can see here as we scroll through it, we're seeing the extent of that resorption and how that affects the rest of the tooth. Um, Additionally, we can make slices and put that um, and calculate that with the rest of the system. We can see where those slices are so that I can see if where it affects the anatomy and what to expect when treating that anatomy. So for example, in this particular case, I had an external cervical resorption defect that affected the buckle, but only at the cervical area. So it was treatable. And I could see that this tooth had two canals, um, so I could treat both. And then when it comes to lateral lesions, as we had discussed earlier, we can see in this particular case that there's a periapical radiolucency, um, sorry, a lateral radiolucency, and that lateral radiolucency is, on the, is in the mid root. That mid root lateral lucency can mean a number of things. 
on the CT, it was a very localized lesion, just as we can see here in the 2D radiograph. We can trace sinus tracts, so that's what the uh, gutta percha piece on the outside of the tooth is. And then if we don't see, for example, any deep probings and we don't see any signs of a fracture and we don't see it becoming a continuous bone loss on a CPCT, we can then confirm, put together both the 2D and 3D radiographs to confirm that this tooth can be treated or is possibly treatable, treat it, possibly treat it in two visits if we want to evaluate for healing. And then we can confirm that, yes, there was a, a lateral canal after all. It wasn't particularly visible, the lateral canal on my CBCT, but I did I suspect there's one because of the existence of that lateral lucency. And then when it comes to those lateral lesions, they don't always, they can mean many different things. So one thing we're looking for, for example, is whether or not there's a fracture. So in this particular case, this tooth had possibly um, suspicions of one, had a large post, had existing root filling material, had a periradial lucency and furcal radial lucency, furcal um, bone loss and furcal lucency. We can see that here in the CBCT that that was also in line with it, that we had a periapical radial lucency that's much more, that's even more visible on the CBCT. We can see that the post is in the distal, but it doesn't seem to be excessive, meaning it seems to be pretty um, centered. And, and there are some, however, radial lucencies in the furcation, and they seem to be at two different points. So we can see that here and um, the periapical radial lucency there. Since there wasn't a deep probing and the periapical radial lucency didn't seem to extend and combine all the way to the mid root, and this patient really, really, really wanted to maintain this tooth as well as the restorative doctor also wanted to, even though there was this shape, we could see that since it doesn't appear to join and that there are not severe, um, uh, there weren't severe like bone loss or, or tooth structure loss, we could try to treat this after removal of the post and finding like additional canal, like additional anatomy, because we could see from the previous one that yes, it's uh, centered, but that bottom left shows that there's a missed canal. Um, we can see that that second canal is even uh, is visible in that post-operative. So it's like that wide oval shaped post-op and this patient had healing. So that's why we had, um, that treatment was successful and in line with all the findings. And then when it comes to CBCT, we can also use the CBCT to map the anatomy and calculate it as described earlier. So we can use it to make very, very accurate measurements, knowing where those curvatures are, measure where the curvatures are in relation to the rest of the canal system, as well as, well as where the apex is, so that we can plan out surgery, we can plan out where it is in relation to vital structures, or if there are certain curvatures that we need to be aware of both in uh, first time treatment or surgical treatment. So basically, I know that's a lot of information, a lot of things to put together, but we want to put everything together with the incidences and historical findings for how likely it is to find a certain number of canals in certain teeth. Understanding those um, likelihoods are going to be important for the diagnosis because we're going to put that together with the 2D radiographs and the 3D radiographs. And all those things are important to keep in mind because that tells us how difficult a case may or may not be. And if a case is more difficult, we have to keep in mind that that's going to be a higher likelihood of having uh, more endodontic mishaps, such as missed canals or uh, perforations or other issues. And then we want to be able to manipulate both the 2D and the 3D radiographs in order to better understand it. I know that's a lot of information. So if you have any questions, definitely feel free to contact me at my Instagram or email. Thank you so much to everybody for tuning in tonight. Um, and thank you again to Henry Shine for having me as part of their webinar series. And this was a nice kind of conclusion to all my webinars on CBCT. Definitely check out the um, Henry Shine website, my previous webinars on how to take CBCT, how to read a CBCT in particular, because I know I kind of breezed through it today, as well as what the importance of CBCTs and other aspects such as restoratively driven endo and other different topics are all on their website and often put all the information together.
Um, and feel free to contact me if you have any other questions. Thank you again to everyone. And thank you again to Henry Schein. Good night. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Tran. Uh, yes, if anyone wants to see Dr. Tran's previous webinars from this year, feel free to email webinars at henryshine.com and I will get those to you as soon as I can. All right, we are a little over, but we do have some questions here. Um, do you feel there is a more or most important part of the canal system that requires denser obturation? Um, so, uh, all canals, all parts of the canal system should be properly condensed at all sections. Um, missing anatomy is not really a recommendation for anything. Um, so I'm not really, uh, not really sure. All right, let's try this one. Um, at what point is it generally advised one should stop cleaning and shaping? I'm sorry, at what point? At what point is it generally advised that one should stop cleaning and shaping? So um, one should stop cleaning and shaping after you have adequately instrumented all the way to the apex, adequately cleaned out all parts of the anatomy. So basically all the number of canals that there are present um, at, and that you're expecting. And then you're adequately able to properly do all the chemical and uh, mechanical debridement with like our irrigating solutions and everything. It's not about a specific size. Previous research, uh, such as different papers by Trope or different other papers like size 40 or 40, those are all very older papers and older styles based on previous research. It's most important to adequately clean all the type, uh, all parts of the anatomy with, uh, you know, generally with, uh, with, with at least a size 20, 25, 30 um, file, but it really depends on the canal. For example, a palatal canal and an MB2 canal are going to be two different sizes. You're not going to necessarily try to force an MB2 to also be um, a size 40 or 4. So it depends on the canal. Given the different patterns in pulp floor designs, is there a pulp floor anatomy trick for finding MB2 and maxillary molars? Uh, short, sorry, short answer is that it's generally straight lingual to the MB1, and it's going to often be under like a little bit of a lip of dentin. Basically, you can often see this little groove that extends from the MB1 to the MB2. That groove is generally where the MB2 is located. However, I would definitely pra recommend practicing as much as possible, looking at a CBCT to see that MB2 and then practice looking for that MB2. So seeing it on a radiograph is one thing, knowing how to find it and how know how to properly find it without destroying the tooth is the other thing. But generally it's straight lingual um, to the MB1. Um, I see a lot of apical puffs in your root canal treatments. Can this become trouble later if there is no room outside of the apical PDL? Um, I'm not sure what they meant by no room. Um, apical puffs generally are a sign that there is patency and that the tooth has been, the canal system has been obturated to that aspect, especially with many of the more modern um, sealers, such as bioceramic sealers, they are biocompatible and bioactive without being bio, uh, without being um, toxic to the tissues. So, so there is no, um, concern of having a puff. Generally, a puff is a good sign that sealer has this sealing to the apex. Um, additionally, those puffs are important to see like a lateral canal and using a bioceramic sealer, for example, or one of the modern sealers can means that that area is sealed. Um, of course, you don't want to be excessive about it. You're not trying to make gigantic puffs that like destroy the, um, go into vital structures or go into IA. What CBCT are you using? That's a question I often get. Um, the I've heard Bruno Acevedo have the best answer, which is that it depends on the one that you're, it's, the best CBCT is the one you actually use. But the better answer is, or another way to answer is that it really depends on what fits you and your office. Um, there are so many different systems and each one is going to be a little bit different. They're going to have different footprints. 
different sizes, different like so. For example, um, you know, my type of my use of CVCT is generally generally going to be a limited field of view. My surgical colleagues are going to need a large field of view to do their implants. So it depends on what you need it for. It depends on the size of your office, and it depends on what kind of modes and modules you'll need. So. It really, it's just what fits you best. You want to talk to your um, representatives to see what would be the best fit for your office. If you put methylene blue on the teeth and watch in the CBCT scan, could you better view the crack or fracture? Um, so methylene blue stains it clinically, yes, uh, but it's not radio opaque, so it wouldn't be visible in a CBCT. But I think if they're asking about like the methylene blue with the CBCT, it means that you're trying to put together the clinical information with the radiographic information. So for example, if you see that there's a crack clinically coronally on and you stain it with methylene blue or the other pro tip is you can also use caries indicating solution. And then you see that on a CBCT that that there's bone loss in the same area as the crack all the way like through the mid root to the apical area then yes, you can put those two things together and better diagnose a crack. But I think when I mentioned that cracks are not be able to always able to be diagnosed on a CBCT, it's that I'm saying you're not able to always see the two pieces be separated with the crack as a visible black line always so easily on a CBCT. A lot of times you're looking for where the bone loss is as well. All right, follow up. The audience wants to know what CBCT you are currently using. In your practice, I actually use a. Um, I I actually use the Plan Mecca one as well. I really like the um, use, like the user interface of that one a lot. Um, but there are many systems out there that can be a great option for your office. So it's best to double check to see what fits you. All right, and last question, I believe. What sealer do you use? What sealer do I use? Yes. So I. Do recommend a very good flowing sealer um, to be to best fill all aspects of the canal system. Um, so bioceramic sealers are great if you need something that is set firm. Resin sealers are great in other aspects. I actually mix and match different types of sealers in different situations. It really depends on the situation. So sometimes I even fill my cases with just with a uh, MTA or a bioceramic because it is necessary. So for example, if the canal is particularly large. So it depends on the it depends on the tooth. All right. I think we got through them all. Thank you so much, everyone, for all the great questions. And thank you for your time, Dr. Tran. We did record tonight's webinar, so we'll get that out to you within a week or so. If you again any additional questions, feel free to reach out to Dr. Tran directly, or you can email us at webinars at henryshine.com for her previous webinars. Um, yeah, I think that's it. We've got a couple more this year. So if you're interested, henryshinedental.com slash webinars for our upcoming webinar schedule. And I'm sure we'll uh we'll be hearing from you next year. Great. Thanks so much, everyone. Again, good night. Great. Thanks.